morning, everybody. Great to be here. A joy to be with you all. I'm so grateful to God for the faithfulness of this church and for your pastor and for the ministry that uh, has been happening here in Chino for decades. And it's a privilege, a joy to be able to be out here this morning. And I'm really looking forward six weeks from now to being back here to be with the couples for the couples conference. And I want to encourage you to come out and spend today. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to look at how we can rethink relationships and rethink marriage because I think most of us have gotten our cues about what marriage is supposed to be like from movies and from pop songs instead of from the Bible. So we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about what makes for a strong and a healthy marriage. And I hope you'll invite people. You know, this is a great opportunity for you to invite folks who may not come to church regularly, get them to come out for a fun Saturday where we focus on marriage, a great event. So looking forward to being back. That's six weeks. It's the 27th of August and uh, really looking forward to being here for that. All right. If you have your Bible, and I hope you do. I want you to meet me in Luke chapter 11 this morning. And we're going to talk about a parable in Luke 11 that helps us understand prayer. That's going to be our focus. I don't know where you learned about prayer or how you learned how to pray. Some of us are still learning. And on that journey, I think it's a lifelong journey to learn about prayer. But maybe you grew up in a home where prayer was normal or regular. Maybe you prayed for meals. Maybe you grew up in a home where Jesus' name was not used in prayer, but was used in other ways. Maybe you have had formal instruction about prayer, or maybe you've just watched other people do it. But all of us have kind of come to prayer with questions, wondering, how does this work? What's it all about? And Jesus gives instruction about prayer in Luke chapter 11. I grew up in a church where as a boy, uh, we memorized the Lord's Prayer. We were taught when I was very young. Before I knew what a debt or a debtor was, I was praying about forgiving debts as as, uh, we forgive our debtors. I didn't know what I was saying. I'm, I'm glad I had that memorized. It served me well through the years. I think it's good to memorize the Lord's Prayer. But you can, you can grow up with a mindset that God's design for prayer is that we memorize something and then we just repeat it. We chant it. We, we, uh, we, we say it over and over again, kind of like the Pledge of Allegiance. It's a new declaration. God's design for prayer is very different than that. In fact, I don't think it was Jesus' intention when he gave us the Lord's Prayer for us to memorize and repeat it. He was giving us a pattern for prayer that would help us think about and more carefully and clearly pray to Him. So while it's not bad to recite the Lord's Prayer, I don't think that's the main purpose for it. Uh, Our focus this morning is going to be on a passage where Jesus is giving instruction on prayer, and after He teaches Uh, the the basic framework for prayer, he comes back around with a couple of illustrations that honestly have always been a little confusing for me. I don't know if when you've read these parables about prayer that we're going to look at this morning, if you've read them before, I don't know if you've walked away scratching your head saying, so what am I supposed to do with that? I, I have for years kind of hurried past some of these parables and thought, That doesn't make any sense to me. I'll just get to the next part that makes sense. So I spent a little time recently digging back in and saying, what is Jesus telling us when he shares these parables about prayer? And that's what I want our focus to be on here this morning. So we're going to read Luke 11, beginning at verse 1. We'll read through it together. And before we read God's word, let's take a minute and let's ask him to bless the reading of his word. Father, as we come now to your word, we come as needy people. We are in need of the work of your Spirit in our hearts and our lives. We confess to you that without your Spirit, we're helpless to comprehend what your Word is teaching us here. So, Holy Spirit, be our teacher this morning, we pray. And Lord, our our hope, our desire is that we would not only understand this issue better today, but that we would be more than hearers of your word, we would be doers of your word. Speak to us again through your word, by your spirit, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, you follow along as I read, this is the word of God for the people of God. The Bible says, now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, 
teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is a friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. Here's how we're going to divide this passage up. We're going to look at four things as we look at this passage. We'll look first at what I called the predicament. That's verse one. And then we'll look at the pattern that Jesus gives for prayer in verses two through four. Then we'll look at the parable, which is in verses five through 10. And then in verses 11 through 13, we'll look at what I call the promise. So uh, we're going to start with this area of the predicament. And, and I think starting here is, is why the disciples, we, we have to understand why the disciples are asking Jesus to teach them to pray. So Luke tells us that Jesus had been praying in a particular place. And when he was done, one of the disciples said to him, teach us to pray. And and I think you have to understand what the disciples thought about prayer in order to understand what was behind that question or when, when they asked for, for instruction on prayer. If you had grown up as one of the disciples in a Jewish home in Judea or in Samaria or in Galilee, you'd been wherever you were, you would have heard the stories of the patriarchs. You would have heard of the great men of God and you would have heard about some of the interaction between the great patriarchs and, and God. And that would have given you a perspective on prayer that probably would have caused you to be tentative about approaching God. Let me give you an example. If you go all the way back to Exodus chapter 19, in fact, keep your, your finger in Luke 11 and flip back in your Bible all the way to the beginning. Go to Genesis there are 50 chapters in Genesis, so go ahead to Exodus. That's the next book. Go to chapter 19 in Exodus. And let me tell you what's going on in Exodus chapter 19. The children of Israel have been enslaved in Egypt. Moses has led them out of bondage. You know the whole story. You've seen the movie, The Ten Commandments. So he, he brought them out. God brings them out of Egypt after all of the plagues. Pharaoh finally lets them go, and then they're, they're in the wilderness they have just entered into the wilderness, and Moses is now about to meet with God on Mount Sinai, and Exodus chapter 20 is where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. So in the chapter before the Ten Commandments, here's what's going on. I'm going to read this whole chapter uh, just so we can get a feel for what, what the Jews thought of when they thought about how you approach God with any kind of a request. Exodus 19.1 says, on the third new moon... After the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, so that would be about three months after they'd been out of Egypt, on the third new moon, on that day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called out to him on the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, 
You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you up on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. So here's God on the mountain. Moses is up and he says, here's what I want you to tell the people. Remind them that I brought them out of Egypt, that I brought them from bondage and slavery into this place of liberation, that I bore them up on eagles' wings. And now tell them, after deliverance, if they will obey me, we'll have covenant blessing. I'm going to bless them in their obedience. Give them that message. So in verse 7, Moses came and called the elders of the people and set, them, uh, set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the word of the people to the Lord, and the Lord said to Moses, behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. So Moses and God have been having this conversation, and God says, we're, we're about to have a moment. I'm going to come in a thick cloud. Everybody's going to see this. They're going to see you and me talking. I want them to see this so that they know that what they hear from you is coming from me. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, this is verse 10, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around saying, take care not to go up to the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people. They washed their garments and he said to them, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. So this is a setting apart. This is going to be a special day. We got to get ready. We got to be consecrated. And this is God's coming down. Verse 16, on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then God brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped up in smoke because the Lord had descended on it like a fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai at the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord and look, uh, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who, the priests who come uh, near to the Lord, consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them, all right, so you, you get the picture of what's going on. This is a big day. God's coming to speak with, with Moses. And the people are afraid and the mountains are trembling and there's smoke and there's thunder and it's loud and everybody's trembling. Now jump ahead 1,500 years and Jesus' disciples who have heard that story over and over and over again and have thought to themselves, you got to be pretty careful when you go out to talk with God. You could die. They watch Jesus go off and spend hours in prayer with God on a hilltop. And he comes back and he's smiling. And they go, Moses, Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. 
You see what's behind the question? There's something we've learned about prayer growing up that has made us fearful, that has caused us to think we better not go too near God. I don't know that we have rights. There, there's a story. I, it, we can't confirm that this is the case, but you may have heard this, that uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, when the priest would go into the inner sanctum, to the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, uh, they would tie a, a rope around him because they were concerned that if something was wrong, God might kill him in the Holy of Holies, and they would have to pull him out with the rope. Now, again, that's not confirmed. That's not in the Bible, but that's the Jewish mindset. It is, it's a, a terrifying thing to go stand before the God of Israel. Remember Dorothy and the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and the Cowardly Lion going in to see the great and powerful Oz, and they're shaking and they're trembling. That's how Jewish people thought about going before the God of the universe. And now we watch Jesus go have a conversation with God and come back refreshed. Lord, teach us to pray. That's the context here. Now, we should know the Bible does teach that God is holy, that He is high and exalted, and we should go into His presence with reverence and respect. There should be a fear of the Lord as you approach God. Not a, a quaking fear, but a reverent fear of the Lord. But the Bible also teaches that God has welcomed us as children that we are his father. And in the same way that Jesus says, let the little children come to me for of such is the kingdom, our heavenly father says, come to me. I delight in your presence. So these two things are both true and they shape how Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. We can approach God without fear because of what Jesus has done, but we should never approach him casually or carelessly. We should always approach with a clear understanding of who he is. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, I, I know you see the predicament. Let me teach you how to pray. And, and we have to learn how to deal with this tension as well. I don't know what you're thinking about God is or how it has shaped how you come to him in prayer. There are some people who think God is like a kindly old grandfather and you go up to him and you just say, here's what I want. And he pats you on the head and says, here, here, and he gives you whatever you want. Other people who see him as an angry father who doesn't want to be bothered by his children. Some see him as a buddy. Others see him as unapproachable. The Bible helps us shape our thinking to say we can never forget who God is but we are welcome to come into his presence. Think about it this way. Let's say you were best friends growing up with the guy who is president. I don't mean any particular president, not getting political. So you can, you can pick your president. You are either best friends with Barack or Donald or Joe or George. Pick, pick the president you want to be best friends with, okay? You were best friends growing up with whoever this was. And you used to call each other, you know, spunky and dimwit. I mean, you, you thumped each other on the head. You, you fouled each other hard playing basketball. That's just, that's who you were. You had that kind of relationship growing up that was very casual and comfortable. And then this guy gets elected president and he comes to you and says, I want you to serve in my, serve in my administration." Well, as soon as you step into the Oval Office with the, your friend who is now the president, your relationship takes on a whole new turn, right? Now you come into his office and you say, good morning, Mr. President. How can, how can I serve you, sir? Because of there's respect for the office. He's now the president of the United States. Well, turn it around with God. The Jews always saw God as high and holy and lifted up. And to go into his presence, you would go in with your knees shaking. And now he says, sit down, permission to speak freely. We can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Call me George or Joe or Donald. Pick, again, pick your president's name. This is how we have to understand there, there are two truths that are both real. God is near, God is far. God is close, God is high and holy. 
We need to keep both of those in mind. And we see this in how Jesus begins to teach the disciples about prayer. So we move from the predicament into the pattern for prayer. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time in this pattern for prayer. But the place where Jesus starts when the disciples say, teach us how to pray, he says, pray this way. Here's the first thing you say, Father. Now you look through your Old Testament and you find for me the number of times in the Old Testament that anybody called God Father. There are a handful of them, but not many. The thought of calling Yahweh, whose name was so holy we wouldn't even say his name, to call him Daddy, that just blew all the circuits on the disciples' grid. They say, teach us to pray. Okay, call God Father. What? Yes, Father, and then what's the next thing he teaches them? Hallowed be your name. Jesus says, you start prayer remembering you have access to God as a father and his name is holy. And you let those two truths guide the rest of the conversation. So the pattern for prayer begins with that that essential element. Draw near, but don't forget who you're drawing near to. This is your father who is holy. And then he says, after you've done that, in, in the pattern for prayer, make sure you're aligning your priorities with his priorities. Going to prayer is not trying to get God on your agenda. It's about you getting on God's agenda. So after you say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's saying, Lord, the reason I'm here is not to talk you into doing things my way, but to do things your way. Father, hallowed be your name. I want to be on the same page with you. And then we confess that we are utterly dependent on him for everything in life. Give us today our daily bread. Lord, we can't make it through the day without you. Everything we have is a gift from you. We come dependently. You're our Father. Your name is holy. We want to be about your agenda. We're completely dependent on you. And we are in need of grace. We need your forgiveness to to come. Now you understand, when you come into a relationship with Jesus, your sins, past, present, and future, are done away with. God forgives them in that moment. You have sins you have not committed yet that God has already forgiven. That's the promise of God. The Bible tells us that we're to confess our sins before God because if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to not only forgive our sins, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Your sins are forgiven. Why do I need to confess my sins to God? To be cleansed from all unrighteousness. So the cleansing, we come to God acknowledging we know we still have sin issues in our lives, Lord. We're dependent on your grace for life. And we are not only dependent on grace for life, but we are intending to be dispensers of grace to others. So give us forgiveness as we seek to forgive others. And then, Lord, we know we're weak and we're frail and we're feeble, so lead us not into temptation. That pattern that Jesus has just laid out puts you in the proper framework for whatever you're going to ask for next. You have now established what you need to keep in mind as you go before God with whatever request is on your heart. You come in and reposition your thinking about who God is, about who you are, about the reality of your needs. Jesus says, when you pray, make sure this is the pattern that you follow as you go through this. And then he says, bring your request before God. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't ask God for what's on your heart. You can. God says, come to me with whatever burden you have. Cast your cares on me. Bring, come come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Those are the promises of God when it comes to prayer. But we do it 
with this essential framework in mind that says, but we want to remember who we are, who we're talking to, and what's true. So that's the pattern that he gives. He says, this is the foundation that, that prayer should begin with. And then he tells the parable that begins in verse 5. So we move from the pattern to the parable. And the story in this parable, the, the details of the story are pretty straightforward, but it can be a little confusing, I think. He's, well, here's what you need to understand in the parable. In Jesus' day, there was a responsibility on the part of every Jew to provide hospitality for the stranger and the alien. This was considered a, a divine responsibility. Failure to care for the, the needs of the stranger or the alien who came into your village would be to bring disrespect on yourself, on your village, and ultimately on God. So God had said in his law, you are to care for the needs of the, the wanderer, of the stranger, of the alien. So knowing that, we have this story. This guy is at home late at night, and his buddy shows up at his door. It's 11 o'clock, midnight something. He hears a knock on the door. The buddy's there. He said, hey, I know, surprise, you know, I know you didn't know I was coming, but I'm here. Can I crash here tonight? You have a divine responsibility. Of course, you can crash here tonight. But then you look around and you go, I'm out of food. I got no bread. We ate all the bread we had today. And before the Lord, you need to offer your friend something to eat. And you don't have any food. So instead of just saying, hey, sorry, kitchen's closed. We, we ran out of food. You say, not only can you stay here, but I'm going to go out and find you some food at midnight. Right? And 7-Eleven's closed, so you go next door to your next door neighbor. Now, you're walking up to your next door neighbor's door, and the lights are out. They've been out for hours, and you're about to bang on his door to see if you can get him, get some bread for your neighbor. And you're thinking to yourself, my neighbor is not going to be happy when he hears a loud knock on the door. But I got to do this. Because I got to honor the Lord and I've got, there's a stranger in our town and we've got to feed him. So that's the context. Now, have you ever had a, a middle of the night emergency where you had to call somebody, wake them up, go knock on the door, had to disturb them from their sleep? You know, if, if you do that, if you've got a child who's sick in the middle of the night and you need Tylenol or something and you're out and you're going to get some help from somebody, before you disturb them, the first thing you, you say is, Man, I'm so sorry to be calling you this late at night, but, but I need help. I, I need you to help me. And so you disrupt somebody. Sometimes we disrupt people in the middle of the night for trivial reasons. I did recently. I wasn't even thinking about this. So I, I had been, Marianne and I, by the way, my wife's here. Can I introduce my wife? This is my wife, Marianne. Would you stand up and say hi? <laughs> uh, we are, the, the two of us, we are headed up this, um, this afternoon to Forest Home Christian Camp, uh, just outside up in the San Bernardino Hills. We're, I'm at family camp there all this week as one of the speakers. We're looking forward to that and really thrilled that we could get to be here with you this morning, but I'm happy to have my wife here. So my, my wife and I had this situation recently. We had gone to see Top Gun, Maverick, right? And um, we liked the movie and, and we got home. So I was reading uh, the Wall Street Journal a few days later, and there was there had been a review of the movie in the Wall Street Journal, and the, the critic for the movie had said, you know, some of this stuff is just kind of crazy. Well, this guy wrote in, is this up yet? Yeah, so this guy writes in this letter to the editor, and he says, please tell John Anderson, the guy who review, reviewed the movie, we all realize movie critics have to be, well, critical. But as a lifelong military airline and general aviation pilot, I need you to tell them it's the best movie, best, best flying movie I've ever seen. I'm not naive enough to ignore the weaker points of the script, but I would do just about anything to fly an F-18 or an F-14 with or without Tom Cruise on my wing. Right? This is a guy who used to fly planes in the Air Force and has flown for years. He said, man, to fly an F-14 or F-18, he says there's nothing like it. So I'm reading this. It's, it's after midnight, and I'm thinking about Marianne's brother. Marianne's brother served in the Air Force and flew F-14s back in the day. He then went into commercial aviation, worked as a pilot for years. 
I asked him one time, I said, the difference between flying an F-14 and flying an MD-80, what's the difference? He said, it's like the difference between driving a city bus and a Maserati, <laughs> right? And he said, you drive the M-80, you know, you're driving the bus, but you drive that Maserati, man, you can get around. He, he, it was fun flying the F-14. So I read this after midnight, and the first thing I think of is Marianne's brother, and I think, I wonder if he's seen the movie, and I, I, I wonder if he'd agree with Butch Gilbert, the guy in the Air Force. So I, t I copy this, edit uh, this letter to the editor, and I text it to my brother-in-law, David, and went to bed. So, and I copied Marianne on the text. Next morning, I get up, and Marianne says, um, you should probably not text my brother after midnight he sleeps with his phone by his bed with it on in case there's anything the grandkids need. So when he got your ding after midnight, he probably, he, he was, I'm, I'm imagining he's awakened and he goes, oh, do the kids need something? And then he reads this stupid thing about Top Gun from his brother-in-law, right? <laughs> so all of a sudden I, I, I felt bad. I didn't realize that. He did write back kindly though. And here's what he said. He said, Bob, no doubt this came from you. It shows it was sent at 1.05 in the morning. Okay, so it was after midnight. <laughs> but he went on to say, the plot of the movie is preposterous. The flying scenes were awesome. The techniques of flying low altitude at very fast speed are taught to fighter pilots. It's very dangerous. One second and it's in the rocks. Most fighters when I was flying could do nine Gs, but the strain on the body was pretty hard. We would come back from a dogfight drenched in sweat, even though we were in an air-conditioned cockpit. It's a good escapist movie. So there's a fighter pilot's review of Maverick for you. But that has nothing to do with the parable. So let's get back to the parable. <laughs> the, the only connection here is the guy in the parable is getting awakened in the middle of the night, not for something stupid like a Top Gun text, but because his neighbor needs bread. And how does he respond? He responds by saying, go away. We're all asleep in here. You woke the whole house. Leave us alone. Find bread somewhere else. And the next door neighbor won't let up. Keeps knocking. But I need bread. Leave us alone. I need bread. Finally, God goes, okay, here's your bread. Now leave us alone. That's how the exchange happens in the parable. Now, if you're like me, you would read this parable and think, is this trying to teach us? Is Jesus saying, the way to get God to do what you need him to do is just keep pestering him. Yes, he'll be really annoyed with you when you come asking, but you just keep pestering and he'll finally give in. Does that sound to you like what Jesus is trying to do? Does that sound like God to you? Follow me here. Go back to where we started. The Jews to whom Jesus is speaking... His disciples are thinking Exodus 19. I can't go wake up God. He could come in thunder. He could come in a cloud. He might kill me. Jesus is saying, your next door neighbor's like that. Not God. This is not a parable to show us what God is like. It's a parable to show us what God isn't like. How he's different than this. How he's a good father, not a grouchy neighbor. The point of the parable is if, if you think you need to pester your neighbor to get what you want, that may be true, but God's not like that. He's not sleeping. You're not disturbing him. You come to the Lord and you say, Lord, I want to honor you. I want to obey your word. I want to serve my neighbor who's in need, but I ran out of daily bread. Can you help me? Jesus is not so he, God's not there saying, oh man, you're annoying me because you want to keep my will. You want to serve. And then he says, based on the parable, so here's the point. Keep coming to God. Keep knocking. Keep asking. Keep, keep seeking. When we read that, we can tend to read that and think what this means is when you ask God once, you have to there's a magic number that you've got to get to before the breakthrough will happen. So keep on asking because you don't know what the magic number is and God does. He knows it's 87. And if you quit at 86, you're not going to get it, but you get the magic. See, that's not how God works. What Jesus is saying here is whatever the burden on your heart is, don't quit asking. 
Don't quit seeking. Don't quit knocking. Don't, don't think, I can't go back to God with this again. I, I can't lay this. I, I'm, I'm probably annoying him. No, you're not. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. He is not put off by your requests. You know, there's another parable that's like this in Luke chapter 18 about an old woman who goes to a judge late at night and she's knocking on the door because she wants justice. It's the same story. And again, the idea is God's not like the unrighteous judge. He's a righteous judge. God's not like the grouchy neighbor. He's a good father. Keep coming, keep asking. Professor Daryl Bach from Dallas Seminary in his commentary on Luke's gospel says, the point of this parable is this, God is approachable and should be approached often and with confidence. If an irritated person responds to boldness, you can be bold with a gracious one. So you should continually pray. Now, a couple of caveats here. Here's one caveat. Before you come to God with your request, work through Luke 11, 2 through 4. The reason that this parable comes after Jesus' teaching on prayer is because Jesus is saying, before you bring the request to God and knock on the door and say, here's what I'm looking for, remember who you're talking to. Remember whose kingdom this is. Remember that you want it to be about his agenda Remember that he is the one who provides for your needs, that you need grace, you need to be a dispenser of grace, and you're weak. Remember all of that before you say, here's my need. You don't just barge in and say, hey, God, here's what I need. To no, you come in and say, Lord Jesus, hallowed be your name. I want what you want. I want your kingdom to come. So you, you frame your requests with that mindset in mind. And second, notice that this man is not coming with just some, some personal appetite or desire that he, he wants God, some itch he wants God to scratch. He's coming because he wants to, to honor God by serving his neighbor. The request he's making to God is not a request for himself. It's a request to do God's will. So he's coming with that. I don't think it's by accident that in telling the story, Jesus has the man in the story seeking to do the will of God. He is asking his neighbor to help him do God's will. Do you think if you go to God and say, God, ask, help me to do your will, he's going to say, leave me alone, I'm bothered by you. No. And that leads to what I'm calling the, the promise in verses 11 through 13. There's another simple illustration. So you got the parable of the grouchy neighbor, but then you've got this illustration where Jesus, not, not a story, but he says if a, a child comes to his father and asks for a good thing, asks for bread, is the father going to give him a snake? If he asks for an egg, is the father going to give him a scorpion? And the obvious answer is a good father is not going to do that. Again, we're back to where we've, we, we started. Your grouchy neighbor might throw a snake out the window at you if you're asking for bread, but not God. You come asking for bread, he's going to go, yeah, that's, a, that's good. here's your bread. A good father is going to give good gifts to his children. He knows what they need. In fact, he knows what you need. Catch this. He knows what you need better than you do. Okay, I know you think that what you need is really what you need. God knows what you need better than you know what you need. Now, if your parents, you know this, your three-year-old thinks he knows what he needs, right? But you know better than your three-year-old knows. Your three-year-old, every three-year-old I know in the history of three-year-olds has done this. It's 30 minutes before dinner, you're in the kitchen cooking, and your three-year-old comes in and they say to you, Mama, I'm, what's the word? Hungry. Mama, I'm hungry. Can I have a treat? And you say wisely to your three-year-old, no, sweetheart, we're about to have dinner. Mom's cooking dinner. We're going to eat in about 30 minutes. So we're, we're not going to have a treat. That would spoil your appetite. And does your three-year-old go, oh, yeah, okay, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Yeah, I just hadn't thought. 30 minutes. Okay, that, yeah, perfect. What does a three-year-old do when you say no treat? Mommy, I want me. And they, Right? We're like three-year-olds sometimes with our request to God. We don't know. 
I, I don't know if you have these. Do you have a ho-hose out here, right? So if you have hostess ho-hos, your three-year-old comes to you and it's, it's 30 minutes before dinner. Mommy, can I have 10 ho-hos? You're going to say, no, sweetie. First of all, even if you, even if you haven't eaten in a day, you're not eating 10 ho-hos. That's bad for anybody. But that's what the, the three-year-old wants. God is, God is saying, you come to me with a request. I know what you're going to need. Now, so we have, if, if you come asking for an egg, even 30 minutes before dinner, God may say, it's not egg time now, sweetheart. We're not going to do that, right? But let's flip this around. Let's say you go to God and ask for a scorpion or a snake. Because you don't know about the danger. You, you take your, your six-year-old to the reptile store. Do they have reptile stores? I don't know. You take them to the reptile store, and there's a snake in the cage, and it's a poisonous snake. And he goes, oh, that's so cool. Can we get it? A good father's not going to say, sure, you can keep it in your room, right? <laughs> because you know better what could happen with the poisonous snake. So even if your kid wants it, you're not going to give it to him. So when, when we go to God and ask for the wrong thing, a good loving father is going to say, no. And we may be like a three-year-old go, but I want it. And God says, no, but you don't need it. It's not what's best for you. A good father can be counted on to give good gifts, even when that good father says no to what you're asking for. But the point of the parable is, Keep being bold, keep coming, keep asking. If what you're asking for is what you need, God's going to give it to you. If it's not what you need, a good God will say no, sweetheart. But don't put off asking God what you need because you think you're bothering him or he doesn't really care about you or he might get mad at you. That's the big idea of the parable here. And there's a punchline. And I don't want you to miss the punchline because it's in verse 13. Jesus says, even an imperfect fallen father knows how to give good gifts to his children. He talks about evil fathers. By the way, that's all of us. But if you think that's some special cat, no, we're all sinful fathers. We all make mistakes. Even an evil father who has his own issues still knows how to give good gifts to his children. So even if an evil father knows how to give good gifts, God knows better. When you go to God and say, will you give me this? God's going to say to you every time, I'm going to give you something better than what you're asking for. What's that? I'm going to give you me. See, that's verse 13. If, if a, an evil father knows how to give good gifts, good gifts, won't a good father give you the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God, the third person of the Trinity, permanently dwelling with you which is what you need more than the fish or the egg or any of it. When you ask God for whatever it is you ask him for, God says, I got something better for you. I'm going to give you the best gift of all. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. You say, I want a fish or an egg. God says, I'm going to give you a chef and a dietitian. You see, see that it, what, it means whatever you face in life, God says, you're going to face some hard things, but you'll never face them alone. You'll never face them without me being there with you, facing it with you. Even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the psalmist says, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me and your rod and your staff comfort me. J.C. Ryle, who was the Anglican preacher in the late 1800s in England, says this. He says, the Holy Spirit is beyond doubt the greatest gift which God can bestow on men and women. Having this gift, we have all things, life, light, hope, and heaven. Having this gift, we have God the Father's boundless love. We have God the Son's atoning blood, and we have full communion with the three persons of the Blessed Trinity. Having this gift, we have grace and peace in the world that now exists and glory and honor in the world to come. So you might not get your egg today, but you've got God with you. You ask God for help, and God says, here's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the helper. You say, God, I need comfort. He says, I'm going to give you the comforter. 
You say, God, I need wisdom. He says, I'm going to give you the counselor. You say, God, I need insight. He says, I'm going to give you the spirit of truth. And the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, when you don't know how to pray, Romans 8, the Holy Spirit knows how to pray for you. There's no need you have that has a better answer for it than the presence of God walking with you. The point of this passage is we do have a loving Heavenly Father who is ready to receive His children and ready to give them good gifts. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Don't be intimidated. Your neighbor may be grouchy. A bad father may not always give good gifts to his, to his children, but God is a good father. He's never sleeping. He's never grouchy. He's ready. Keep asking. Don't be intimidated. But it's for those who can call God Father. And you need to know this. Not everybody can. Back in the 1800s, there, were, there was a movement among clergy people that was called the Fatherhood of God and the Brotherhood of Man movement. And it was the idea that if God is the Father of all, then we are all brothers. Well, it's a nice sentiment. In fact, I remember learning, in, when I was in elementary school, we learned this song that was, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Have you ever heard this song? And then there's like, with God as our Father, brothers all are we. Okay, if God is your Father, then we're all brothers. It's great to be able to come to Southern California and know I'm here with my brothers and sisters. Okay? But not everybody is a child of God. How do I know that? Because Jesus says in John 1, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, to them he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. Those who have God as their father are those who have received him, those who have believed in his name and have committed themselves to him and say, I will follow you, Lord. That's how you become a child of God, by surrendering your life and giving yourself to him. So anybody who says, I'm a child of God, but I don't follow my father, doesn't understand what it means to be a child of God. The good news is everybody is welcome. There's nobody who comes to God and says, I want you as my father, who God says, yeah, I'm not interested. God is welcoming all who will come, surrender themselves, and say, I've made a mess of my life. I, I need a good father who will guide and direct. I need the presence of the Holy Spirit with me to walk through this life. I can't do this on my own. I can't make this on my own. I'll die on my own. God says, come be my child. The offer is there, but you have to receive him and believe on his name. And for those of you who are here, those of you who are watching online, if you have never taken that step to go from being somebody who knows about God to somebody being a child of God, today can be that day for you. Today can be the day when you go from death to life, from darkness to light, and it's simple by, by surrendering to Jesus and saying, Lord, I need you. I know I've made a mess of my life. I, I want you to come in to my life. I want you to be with me always. I want to follow you. Thank you for what Jesus did on the cross to pay for my sin. Thank you that he rose from the dead to give new life. I now trust myself to you. I will follow you and be your child. Thank you for being my father. It's as simple as a prayer like that. And so I want to ask you to pray with me here as we close this morning. Father, as I